Hello, and in this uh, video, I want to revisit the issue of the Emperor Heraclius, who was uh, probably, hypothetically, the last of the East Roman emperors proper, right? If you consider that the uh, East Roman Empire uh, existed between Constantine and the rise of Islam, right? Uh, and uh, the reason I say the uh, East Roman Empire as distinct from the medieval Byzantine polity is because in the East Roman Empire um, they still preserved the political institutions, the social norms, and the Latin language, at least as far as the state was concerned. Um, the language of the common people was probably Greek. The language of the church was certainly Greek, but um, it wasn't until after the uh, rise of Islam that in the medieval Byzantine polity, they, uh, you know, replaced Latin with Greek as the official state language. And they made other changes in, in terms of the political economy that I've already touched about, which in Marxist historiography is called Asiatic mode of production. I've already talked about it. I'm not going to touch it again. But uh, the reason I want to, and, and you know, the territorial, um, the territorial content of the East Roman Empire included, uh, you know, um, the city of Constantinople, uh, the Balkans, Greece, Anatolia, Syria, the Levant, Egypt, North Africa, and sections of Spain. Okay, so as opposed to the medieval Byzantine polity, which is basically just the Anatolian Peninsula and Constantinople, with on a good day some pieces of Greece. Um, yeah, so. I am going to look about the facts about the Emperor Heraclius uh, from two sources, two historical sources. Uh, the 1911 edition of Encyclopedia Britannica and the 2006 edition of Encarta Encyclopedia, Microsoft Encarta Encyclopedia, both of which are now public domain, right? So uh, I am going to look at what experts in the past had to say about um, the Emperor Heraclius. And the reason I'm doing this video is because I want to apologize. I made a factual error. When I made the video talking about the coin I obtained in Istanbul, Constantinople in September of 2000, as a souvenir of my visit to Hagia Sophia, I said that the Emperor, that Heraclius was the exarch of Africa and that he had staged a uh, a rebellion against Pocas because Pocas and then that Pocas used uh, you know the territorial the, the, the border territorial defense troops to try to suppress from Jerusalem which they took as a trophy to Setesipon so at that point Pocas lost the church and uh, and when you lost the church you lost the people and in the Byzantine polity you had to be acclaimed in the East Roman Empire, you had to be acclaimed by the church, the army, and the people. And if you lost the church, you lost the people. And if you lost the people, you know, if your if your rival had uh, the support of the church, he had the support of the people, which means that the army, you know, unless you had, unless you paid the soldiers that were loyal to you a lot of money, the soldiers were likely to join the, your enemy and you would be overthrown, which is exactly what happened to Pocas. Uh, Pocas didn't have the resources to retain, you know, loyalty of the military, not after the people in the church deserted him. So, uh, I said in that video that then uh, Heraclius had seized Constantinople, overthrown Pocas, executed him, and took over, the, took over an emperor, and that he was the exarch of Africa. That's not correct. It was I, incorrect, totally incorrect. Uh, there were two, two Heracluses, Heraclius the Elder and Heraclius the Younger. Heraclius the Elder was the exarch of Africa, and Heraclius the Younger was sent by his father to take Constantinople, overthrow Pocas, execute him, and take over as emperor. That's what really happened. So, and you know, the reason for this this factual lapse is because, I you know, it has been like twenty years since I read John Julius Norwich, the trilogy on, on Byzantium. You know, I read the first time I read it was like in the 90s, the late 90s, and the second time was like in 2004. So, I, you know, a lot of the details escape me or are confused with other details. So, anyways, uh, let's see what the 1911 
uh, edition of Encyclopedia Britannica has to say about Heraclitus. And then I will we will look at what the um, Encarta Encyclopedia uh, 2006 has to say. And I will put links in the description where you can look up uh, the 1911 um, Encyclopedia Britannica, which is public domain. Uh, it's, you know, I think it's a UNESCO heritage document or something like that. And um, the 2006 Microsoft, Microsoft uh, made the 2006 Encarta Encyclopedia public domain. Microsoft, I guess, is their contribution to you know, popular culture, they they gave that to the public, you know, here is this knowledge database that you can have. Microsoft was nice enough to do that, you know. Uh, yeah, so, and it's abandoned where it's, and I'm going to put a link in the description where you can download it, and you can just install it in your in your computer. So, um, so uh, the 1911 edition of Encyclopedia Britannica is like the knowledge database of the British Empire. And uh, the 2006 Encarta Encyclopedia is a knowledge database of, I guess you want to say, you know, in Microsoft Corporation, which is put together by Microsoft Corporation. But the 2006 edition was actually edited by Webster. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a very good. Um, so, yeah. So let's hear, let's, let's read what... Uh, the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica has to say about Heraclius. Uh, quote, Heraclius uh, lived between 575 and 642 AD. East Roman Emperor was born in Cappadocia. His father held high military command under the Emperor Maurice and as governor of Africa maintained his independence against the usurper Pocas. When invited to head a rebellion against the latter, he sent his son with a fleet which reached Constantinople unopposed and precipitated the dethronement of Pocas. Proclaimed Emperor Heraclius set himself to reorganize the utterly dis disordered administration. At first, he found himself helpless before the Persian armies of Chosroes II, which conquered Syria and Egypt and since 616 had encamped opposite Constantinople. In 618, he even proposed in despair to abandon his capital and seek a refuge in Carthage, but at the entreaty of the Patriarch, he took courage. By securing a loan from the church and suspending the corn distribution at Constantinople, he raised sufficient funds for war, and after making a treaty with the Avars, who had nearly surprised the capital during an incursion in 619 AD, he was at last able to take the field against Persia. During his first expedition in 622 AD, he failed to secure a footing in Armenia, whence he had hoped to take the Persians in flank, but by his unwearied energy he restored the discipline and efficiency of the army. In his second campaign, between 624 and 626, he penetrated into Armenia and Albania and beat the enemy in the open field. After a short stay at Constantinople, which his son Constantine had successfully defended against renewed incursions by the Avars, Heraclius resumed his attacks upon the Persians in 627. Though deserted by the Khazars, with whom he had made an alliance upon entering into Pontus, he gained a decisive advantage by a brilliant march across the Armenian highlands into the Tigris Bay Plain and a hard-fought victory over Chosroes general Shash Varas, in which Heraclius distinguished himself by his personal bravery. A subsequent revolution at the Persian court led to the dethronement of Chosroes in favor of his son Kava II. The new king promptly made peace with the emperor, whose troops were already advancing upon the Persian capital Ctesiphon. In 628. Having thus secured his eastern frontier, Heraclius returned to Constantinople with ample spoils, including the True Cross, which in 629 he bought back in person to Jerusalem. On the northern frontier of the empire, he kept the Avars in check by inducing the Serbs to migrate from the Carpathians to the Balkan lands so as to divert the attention of the Avars. The triumphs which Heraclius had won through his own energy and skill did not bring him lasting popularity. 
In his civil administration, he followed out his own ideas without referring to the nobles or the church, and the opposition which he encountered from this quarter went far to paralyze his attempts at reform. Worn out by continuous fighting and weakened by dropsy, Heraclius failed to show sufficient energy against the new peril that menaced his eastern provinces towards the end of his reign. In 629, the Saracens, uh, that was unfortunately a racist pejorative term that they used in 1911 to refer to Muslims, sorry. Uh, in 629, the Saracens made their first incursion into Syria, and in, and in 636, they won a notable victory on the Jermuk, and in the following years conquered all Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, the Battle of Jermuk. That was the end of, that was the end of the East Roman Empire. It was, you know, yeah, the armies of Omar, you know, broke the power of the Roman, the Roman army and annexed Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, you know. Um, Heraclius made no attempt to retrieve the misfortunes of his generals, but evacuated his possessions in sullen despair. The remaining years of his life he devoted to theological speculation and ecclesiastical reforms. His religious enthusiasm led him to oppress his Jewish subjects. On the other hand, he sought to reconcile the Christian sects, and to this effect propounded in his ecthesis a conciliatory doctrine of monotelism. monotelism. And ecthesis, of course, was his theological, one, one of his uh, texts um, where he uh, discusses theological issues. And the doctrine of monotelism is um, an attempt to compromise the, uh, the Nicene Creed, uh, the Nicene Christology regarding Jesus with the uh, monophysite uh, Christology. And you know, in 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 the Council of Ni in, in, in Nicene Christology, which is the Orthodox Christology, uh, Christ is both man and God at the same time, uh, but it has two natures. But in uh, monophysicism, is one nature, and you know, uh, it, a certain version of it is that the only nature is divine. So that and it, it lends itself to those the Docetic heresy, which is that you know, uh, Jesus was only divine, and that the the humanity was an illusion. An appearance only. He was. He only appeared to be human when, in fact, being a god. Something to that effect. Anyways, Heraclius tried to like in his ecstasies. Heraclius tried to reconcile these two positions. I need to look up exactly how he pulled that one because it's like trying to. I mean, how, you leave that out. I'm gonna not dwell too much on. This is not about Christology. Anyways, Heraclius died on his of his disease a dropsy in for 642. In spite of his partial failures, Heraclius must be regarded as one of the greatest Byzantine emperors, and his early campaigns were the means of saving the realm from almost certain destruction. Okay, so that's what Encyclopedia Britannica had to say in 1911 about him. Um, and let's see, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica 1911 cites authorities. Authorities is what the term they use for citations, and it says here history of Greece. Uh, from Polish at Oxford in 1877, uh, a book called The Late Roman Empire, published in London in 18, 1889, um, uh, an Italian book called Le Imperatore Eraclio, published in Florence in 1905. Um, let's see, a French book, Historie di Eraclius published in Paris in 1904, and an article in the English Historical Review from 1904. So, the, the, yeah, so basically the, the, the sources for this are um, circa 1877 to 1904. Okay, there. And, you know, you'll, that's, is, is, I mean, the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1911. So, you know, it is the uh, knowledge database of the British Empire, right? Before the internet, like a hundred years before the internet, you had Encyclopedia Britannica. Hmm? Uh, okay, so that's that. And, you know, I recommend that you look if, you know, one good thing, I, I, you know, this is the first time that I look at Byzantine history with the Encyclopedia Britannica. I've looked before um, the American Civil War, especially the article on the Confederacy is very, very good because the people who wrote this were closer to the historical events. So their insight is very unique. And also, uh, uh, what they talk about, 
the the Russian Japanese War of 1906. So it's pretty interesting too. So um, yeah, but um, yeah. So that is a uh, Heraclius Encyclopedia Britannica 1911. And let's see. Now let's look at Encarta Encyclopedia Premium from 2006. And the article is very short, uh, but it says here, um, Heraclius, and the, see, in Encyclopedia Britannica, the date they say is 575 to 642 for his life, but in Encarta Encyclopedia, the 575 has a question mark on it. So 575 in 2006 was not certain. It was in 1911, but not in 2006. So... Heraclius allegedly lived between 575 and 640. Actually, and the 641 also has a question mark next to it. Okay, so the alleged dates of the life of Heraclius are apparently not certain. Uh, in 2006, 575 maybe, 641 maybe. Byzantine Emperor between 610 and 641. That is uh, correct. That is verifiable. Son of the governor of Carthage, Heraclius seized the throne by overthrowing the emperor Pocas, who reigned before between 602 and 610. Early in his reign, the empire was invaded by the Mongolian Avars and by the Persians. In 622, he launched a great counterattack against the Persians, driving them from as Asia Minor, Egypt, and Syria, and pushing into the heart of Persian territory by 628. In 630, he recovered the revert. Christian relic, the true cross, which the Persians had captured, returning it in triumph to Jerusalem. In the west, the Avars were forced back into Central Europe. In religious affairs, he tried unsuccessfully to win the Monophysite Christians back to the Byzantine church by offering them a doctrinal compromise, compromise known as monothelitism. Heraclius is often credited with initiating the theme system in which army commanders were given civil authority over newly organized provinces called themes. His military victories and administrative reforms probably strengthened the empire in the long run, but the constant wars and religious di dissension left it unable to resist the new Muslim threat from Arabia. Before the end of Heraclius' reign, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt had fallen to the conquering Arabs. Okay? And, uh, yeah, and, uh, let's see. I want to see, let, let's see what Encyclopedia Encarta 2006 has to say about monothelitism. Monothelitism, 7th century view that maintained in conformity to traditional Christian doctrine that Christ had two distinct natures, divine and human, but also held that the two natures are manifested in but one will and activity. Yeah, so basically this is uh, very similar to Nestorianism, right? Uh, so you have you know, tu come and tu nome and one prosopon. Very, yeah, um, okay. So the two natures, the two distinct natures are contained within a unified one of will and activity. All right, that's basically, uh, uh, you know, Heraclius was not coming up with anything original here. It's just a rehash of Nestorianism, um, it sounds to me. Um, okay, but this is my my. It sounds like Nestorianism. Sounds like it. Maybe I'm wrong. No, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, the doctrine of uh, sounds similar to Nestorianism, but maybe I am wrong, right? Um, the doctrine of monothelitism was first promulgated around 624 by Byzantine Emperor Heraclius in an attempt to reconcile the orthodox point of view that Christ had two natures with the heretical belief of the Monophysites that he was but one. By, his, by this reconciliation, Heraclius hoped to bring back into the church the thousands of monophysites who had been excommunicated for heresy. The result of the promulgation of monothelitism, however, was not greater unity in the church and empire, but further division, controversy on the question of whether the energy and will of Christ was of a single or dual nature became so violent that in 648, Emperor Constans II forbade all discussion of the subject. It was revived on the accession of Emperor Constantine IV in 668 and remained a disturbing issue until it was finally declared a heresy by the Third Council of Constantinople in 680. The council declared that just as there are in Christ two natures, so are there two wills. 
a human and the divine, the human will be subordinate to the divine. And they left it at that. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. See, because, I mean, you can't, I mean, I'm sorry, but you cannot square the circle. You know, either he is two or he is one. You can have it both ways. You know, it's the same thing with the doctrine of the Trinity. That's why Arianism existed. The Arian, the Arian, Arian, Arius was correct. I mean, I'm, I am a proponent of the Arian Christology. I am a proponent and defender.